And good evening and welcome to the November 12th meeting of the Murfreesboro City School Board. We're glad to have those of you in the audience with us and we're glad to have those that are home that are viewing. Let me give a special welcome to members of the uh, well, leadership, just, leadership uh, Rutherford. Yeah, Leadership Rutherford. I'm sorry, my mind went blank. <laughs> leadership, Rutherford, leadership Rutherford, we're glad to have you with us and hope you'll come back again sometime. But now at this time, I'm going to ask you to stand. We have three young people to lead us in our pledge. Ella Fry, a kindergarten student at Mitchell Nielsen. Mason Johnson, a first grader at Cason Lane, along with Adrian Johnson, a fourth grade student at Cason Lane. Lead us in our pledge, followed by our Mona South. Thank you. All right, members of the board, you have received a copy of the agenda, a printed copy. I have a motion to approve the agenda as printed. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Richardson. We have a second. Second. Thank you, Ms. Long. Any question or comment? I see none. All in favor say aye. 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 The opposition? And there is none. Thank you. Communications. Ms. Trail? Good evening, board. Good evening. Good evening. I have just a few communications for you uh, tonight. First of all, next week is American Education Week, and we will be celebrating all of our educators and our EAs and everyone who makes the schools run. That is from November 18th through November 22nd, so a great time to be just thankful for all of our people that work so hard for our students. <coughs> uh, we're also excited that this year River Oaks Church will be providing full Thanksgiving dinners to 55 families with Mitchell Nielsen. Um, additionally, the Tracy Lawrence uh, organization who's provided meals for us for the last three years will be delivering 100 prepared turkey meals uh, to Case and Lane Academy this year. Um, again, these acts of kindness are just amazing and we are so thankful for all the organizations that come together to help our families enjoy the holidays. Speaking of the holidays, the season of sharing is beginning soon. Uh, thanks to a combined effort of many of our community partners, including Onward Realty, General Mills, the Band of Brothers with North Boulevard, and uh, a few of our own staff members. Uh, students will receive gifts and essential items to make their Christmas very bright. Um, once again, thank you to all of our adopters. North Boulevard Church of Christ will also be hosting their very special Christmas party for about 350 to 400 of our students. We are appreciative of them every year and all that they do for us. A few extra notes that you don't have in front of you. Um, just want to remind you that many of our schools are having holiday events you are invited to attend i hope that you can uh, so far we had so many veterans day events this year and they this week they were just amazing uh, thank you to city tv for airing a lot of these so if you can't make it to the school you can watch city tv and they are doing lots of lots of airing of our activities Discovery School open houses are coming up. We did move the night for the uh, first open house. It will be Monday, November 18th at 6 p.m. Uh, another one will be Thursday, December 19th at 4 o'clock p.m. and that will be on a Zoom session. And then um, Tuesday, January 7th at 8 a.m. will be a coffee and conversation. Those are last minute conversations that you may want to find out before uh, doing the whole registration process. Uh, applications for Discovery School do open on December the 1st, so just around the corner. Um, before I sit down, I do want to say a big thanks to our City Schools Foundation and the board members 
and all of the uh, hours they spent this weekend on the tennis courts and pickleball courts uh, just to make sure that we were raising funds to support our teachers. Those are the communications, sir. Thank you, ma'am, very much. I would mention one thing. Mr. Huddleston passed out to those that were here an uh, invitation to participate in the census count. You got that? You want to? I do have that. I'm so sorry. I just overlooked it. On behalf of the city of Murfreesboro, and which we are definitely a part of, uh, we want to invite you to um, fill out your special census. In fact, I bet you'll give permission to everyone sitting in the audience to go ahead and do that while they're sitting here. Fine. Okay. You want to give a yeah. break right now? So special Takes census about five is going. Minutes. Yeah, mm -hmm. special census is going on now. There's a QR code. It's very easy to do, and uh, the city really does need to get an accurate count of how many residents are living here. It benefits the schools. It benefits the parks. It benefits the city as a total. So, thank you for reminding me of that. Mr. Campbell, because it was right there in front of me and I overlooked it. Okay, all right. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. All right, the best of MCS, Mr. Dr. Duke. Good evening. Before we do this, I have to say, last Friday night was our Read to Succeed Spelling Bee. There were several city council people, uh, Miss Averwater from the uh, city council was on it, as well as, well as Mr. Gore. Um, the city manager was on it. They actually passed that around during the spelling bee. So we want everyone to fill it out. So, um, <laughs> and while we're talking on spelling bee, they did a great job, but I'm so proud to say that it was our 3-6 literacy coordinator, Dr. Prestles, who won the spelling bee. So we're very excited about that. Raised a lot of money for Read to Succeed, who is a fantastic partner for us in our school system. <clears throat> Well, board tonight, I'm excited to recognize our November Best of MCS honoree and publicly thank this employee for the hard work they have contributed to Murfreesboro City Schools. And I'm honored to ask Ms. Francesca Graffio to join me at the podium. Ms. Graffio is currently in her eighth year of teaching, and for the past six of those years, she has been with us in MCS teaching second grade at Black Fox Elementary School. We know that improving literacy is a district goal that is ultimately about ensuring all of our students have access to a future that is full of opportunities and empowerment. We also know that the foundation of this work in literacy improvement is laid in the classrooms of our youngest learners. Today we are recognizing Ms. Graffio for the incredible work she is doing with early literacy. This is work that is being noticed and honored by more than just us here today. I am so excited to say that Ms. Graffio was one of only 20 educators in the state of Tennessee to be honored by the advocacy group Tennesseans for Quality Early Education as a Tennessee Early Educator of the Year Award. There were over 1,700 nominations for this honor. So to be selected as a winner speaks to the incredible work happening in her classroom for students every day. In addition to the honor of being in this inaugural group of teachers, the award also included a $1,000 cash prize and $1,000 for her classroom. Wow. But let's give you a sneak peek of the excitement when she received this honor. Uh, <laughs> I even had a little dance party to celebrate there. Uh, so we are so excited that she received this honor. Miss Kathy Darty, who is our pre-K through second grade literacy specialist, told me the following about Francesca. 
She said, Ms. Graffio is an exceptional teacher. She is passionate about her craft and her students. She flawlessly enhances the learning experience for all students in her classroom, ensuring all students are engaged in the successful work of the building. Building strong relationships with her students in an environment that encouraging, encourages risk-taking is the hallmark of her classroom. She gently encourages students to work beyond what they thought they could do and celebrates their success in a genuinely loving way. She is intentional, she is purposeful, and she works with every student and creates an environment that maximizes their child's potential. What she teaches and encourages daily with her students will go far beyond the four walls of her classroom. Ms. Graffio is an exemplary teacher and a blessing to MCS. Her principal, Ms. Strebel, said that Francesca is an exemplary teacher that is truly loved by all. She is kind, knowledgeable, and has created a joy for teaching and learning throughout her classroom and the Black Box community. She is dedicated, has a positive attitude, and is a marigold and a gift to the teaching profession. I asked Ms. Graffio to talk to me about what she does, and she told me that MCS is truly an incredible place to work. She says she has always felt supported and encouraged by our district and the Black Fox team. She said MCS and our administration at Black Fox have cultivated such a positive environment that is centered around our students while continuing to provide opportunities for our students to learn and grow. Ms. Graffio, we are so proud of you and for the positive light you not only shine on our district, but on the teaching profession as a whole. Thank you for your commitment to our students, to our district. We are definitely a better district because of your work. We are so grateful for you, and we want to thank you for representing the best of MCS. Thank you, Dr. Duke, and I just want to say thank you to Murfreesboro City Schools and the Board of Education for all that you guys do for students and for teachers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Dr. Duke, I believe you're up against Spotlight on Education. Yes, we are. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, so this month, uh, we wanted to shine a light on our ESP program. Uh, the board knows that uh, two years ago, we actually made some structural changes to that program and removed it from our operations department and put it under curriculum instruction. Uh, so tonight, I asked Ms. Arnett and Ms. Hopkins if they would mind uh, updating the board and giving them an update on kind of the successes we've seen with our ESP program in the past um, few year, months. So I'll turn it over to you guys. Good evening, board. Good evening. I know we have talked, to, Dr. Duke and I have talked a lot about the exciting things that are happening in ESP, especially with Ms. Hopkins on board and the things that she is doing with the program. So I'm just very excited tonight to introduce you to her and let you um, have just a few minutes to see what's happening in ESP. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you so much for inviting us to be here with you tonight to talk a little bit about the incredible things that's happening in our extended school program with Murfreesboro City Schools. I want to start by just restating our mission statement. Um, sorry, John told me about getting my keyboard out, but I did not. Um, so I want to restate our mission statement for you guys. The extended school program provides an educationally enriching, safe and fun experience for all students of Murfreesboro City Schools during before and after school hours. We are definitely proud to say that we are a true extension of our school day. Um, we work very hard to create a seamless transition between before, during, and the after school hours, which helps make that really easy and supportive for our students and families. That, of course, aligns perfectly with our district goal of being wired to the core with our students at the very center and ESP being a supportive part of that. So we have kicked off 24-25 with a bang, and we have had so much success in our first quarter, and I want to share a few of those highlights with you guys. We're going to start off with some numbers. I'm a numbers girl, so I love that. So I want to share with you that we have our highest enrollment in ADA post-COVID. And so our enrollment numbers are 2,314 students. And what that means is that ESP is serving 25% of our students. 
that sends a very clear message to us that this program is needed and valued by our families. And how lucky are we to be able to house that within our district? We're one of the very few districts across the state that actually has that under the district umbrella. Other districts do offer that, but it's usually subcontracted out. But we get to offer that from within, which again allows us to be more wired to the core with our students at the very center. Our average daily attendance is 1,802 students. And the biggest part of that is we are proud to say that we do not have a wait list. We can actually accommodate every student who has expressed an interest and a need for our before and after school program. And that's been a really big deal for us. Um, our third point there I'm really proud of. Um, as you know, we are self-funded. We're a self-funded program. In the past few years, we have relied on funds from our stabilization grant to help support that. But fiscally this year, I'm happy to say that our expenditures and our revenues are in line to adequately support our program. So that's a really big deal. Um, focusing on those numbers and looking at the quantity of our program, we also knew it was very important to also focus on the quality as well. As well. So our first quarter, we have had a strong focus on not only staff and site director trainings, but also how do we make sure we're getting that message across to them. Um, we'll talk a little bit about some of the trainings that we have provided, but first I want to talk about the addition to our staff that we've added to help us do this. We've added a curriculum and instruction specialist. Most of you know her, Stephanie Turner. She was an academic coach within the district, so very happy to bring her on board. She works hand in hand with our site directors and our staff to make sure that they are adequately trained to do their job. She works with them on enrichment training. She also works with our grant sites, who as you know, eight of our sites offer certified tutoring after school for those of our students who have an academic need for that. Um, so we have about six tutors per site. She works with, uh, closely with those people to work with this, their classroom teachers and meet the individual needs of those students. Um, we also worked with Andy Taylor very closely to make sure that we had individualized EOPs for, our, for each site, as we know that safety plan looks very different before and after school than it does during the school day. So we appreciate his help with that. Another one of our things we focused on this first, first quarter is developing those relationships with all the departments. As you know, ESP works very closely with every department in our district, so developing those strong supports amongst each other was very important to us. And also creating that consistent culture mindset. Um, we worked very hard to create that family environment because, again, we're really providing that service for our families. So being able to watch those site directors at our family events and build relationships with our students um, has been just amazing and incredible to see. Um, some of our trainings that we've provided this quarter for our site directors, we've had individualized staffing and scheduling trainings. We've had monthly meet, uh, leadership trainings. We've provided CPR and safety training for not only our site directors, but also our staff. Some of the trainings for our staff that we've ensured have been there has been new staff orientation and professionalism. We provide that monthly for them, as well as our prep grant tutorings and behavior management training. Um, I want to make sure that I thank you again for all that you do to provide support for our district as well as ESP. If you have any questions about our program, I want you to feel free to reach out to me. I would love for you guys to come and visit one of our sites. Please feel free to set that up with me. I would love to take you on a tour and see all the fun things that we are doing. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Very much. Any questions? Very good. So what you're telling us is in this. This is not just babysitting in the afternoon. It is not, Mr. Campbell. I know it. I it know is it. not. Okay. <laughs> That's good. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. All right, public comment, and we don't have anybody to publicly comment tonight. Consent items. Members of the board, we have approval on the consent items. Move for approval. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Have a second. Second. Thank you, Ms. Dodd. Any questions? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposition, and there is none. All right, action items. <coughs> Surety bond. Uh, yes, good evening again, board. We are recommending approval of the statutory bond for our finance director, Mr. Owens, for a one-year term that will run from January 5th of 2025 to January 4th of 2026. State law requires the treasury or fiscal agent of the LEA uh, to execute a statutory bond, and this bond protects the school district from the loss of funds. The amount of the bond is 3000 
<clears throat> sorry, the amount of the bond is three million thirty thousand eight hundred and forty three dollars with a premium of two thousand five hundred and one. This is a calculation formula based on the revenues in our uh, budget that was approved by the comptroller. And this amount is commensurate with the approved FY25 budget and no budget amendment would be necessary. And we are recommending approval as presented. Mr. Chairman, I move for approval. Thank you, sir. We have a second. Second. Thank you, Ms. Long. Any question or comment? All in favor say aye. 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 Addition, there is none. Thank you. Board policy 5.306. I'm sorry, yeah. 5.10. 106. Glasses are fogging. This policy change is proposed to modify the requirement for applicants to undergo a physical examination. A physical examination is no longer required under state board policy, and this change will assist with expediting the onboarding process for new employees. Applicants will be required to certify in writing they do not have any contagious or communicable diseases. And this modification aims to reduce the financial and logistical burden on applicants while maintaining a commitment to health and safety within our schools. The recommended policy changes do not carry a direct fiscal impact. However, beginning this year, all employees must also be enrolled in the TBI's new RATBAC program, which consistently monitors law for law enforcement issues. This new program is at a cost of $50 per employee. Um, MCS does plan to cover the cost of enrollment for the Ratback fingerprinting program. And since new employees would no longer be required to obtain a medical exam, the district will shift the initial background check of $37 to the applicant. This adjustment ensures applicants are not burdened with both the background check fee and the initial physical examination cost. And current employees will not be impacted by this at all. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have, and we are recommending approval as presented. We have a motion to approve the application of employment on first read. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. Second. Mr. Rue, thank you, Mr. Settle. Now, any question or comment? I have a question. All right, Ms. Moore. Um, so I understand the, f the fiscal impact. That sounds like it's even. <clears throat> Anytime we say we don't have to have that guarantee we don't have a communicable disease coming in I did hesitate a little bit so could you talk a little bit about what the difference is between what we were getting from physicians before versus just a statement that I don't have any communicable diseases yeah so pre previously we were required that they have a health certificate signed off by a doctor saying that they had been examined by the doctor and um, and that the doctor had certified they were in good health to work what this new requirement does actually allows them to attest a lot more specifically to that they're saying to a list of communicable diseases that we would want to know about that they are verifying saying, I am saying I do not have these uh, or they're notifying us if they are and it's something that we need to follow up with the doctor. So it's actually a little more specific probably than what we were doing beforehand. Okay, so the doctor's notes didn't have to specifically say that before. It did just not. got a good health. Okay, yes. great. thank you. Any other questions? We have a motion and a second to approve. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposition? And there is none. Thank you. All right. Building on Ridgely Road, letter of intent. So as the board is aware, City Schools has been working with the City of Murfreesboro staff for several years uh, to find a new adequate replacement for our 8,800 square foot transportation and maintenance facility that's currently located on New Salem Highway. In addition to no longer meeting the needs of the city school, the city has the potential development plans for the area where the current building is located. City Schools has identified a 47,000 square foot building that would meet the current needs of our district and provide a better long-term solution for City Schools transportation and maintenance facilities. Additionally, the city of Murfreesboro is interested in using a portion of that building for to meet their space and facility needs. We are requesting the board to approve tonight a letter of intent which would allow us to begin official conversations around negotiating a purchase and sale agreement. The letter of intent is not binding on either party and before moving forward both the board and the city council would approve the purchase sale agreement. The project would be funded through multiple funding sources. As this board is aware we have money actually currently allocated in our county shared bonds that has been approved by both the city and the board for the to pay toward the transportation facility the city's general fund would pick up the cost associated with the portion of the building that they would be using 
And then the remaining balance would come from our fund balance. Again, we've had many budget conversations over the last few years about the intent we've had in raising that fund balance for situations such as this. I am going to ask Mr. Barch to come up and provide some more detailed information as well as share some pictures of the facility um, so the board is aware of the property and what information we can share. I will say when he's done, uh, we know that tonight we'll be looking at the letter of intent. If, it, if the board wishes, we can set up a special call board meeting at the location so you can see the building in, per in person prior to actually approving any purchase or sale agreement. The other minor change I want to say is in your board memo, it does say that this letter of intent would not go to City Council. This letter of intent will need to go to City Council and that would happen on Thursday pending your approval at their workshop. We would take this to City Council as well. Uh, but with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Barch and let him present on the building. All right. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, um, sir. A few pictures here uh, just to, to refresh your memory a little bit of our uh, what I call our sweet little building on New Salem. <laughs> uh, it's about an 8,000 square foot facility. Most of you are aware of it. Uh, and now it's kind of nestled down below <laughs> New Salem as right. you've seen the construction. <laughs> so I'm hoping for uh, not any heavy rain soon. Right. Anyway, uh, been a great, uh, great facility for us, but we have clearly outgrown that. And as Dr. Duke alluded to, uh, eventually it's going to have some, the city has plans for that, that, uh, that space. <clears throat> if you look uh, at, your, at your monitors now, this is a, a, a place of the proposed location that we're looking at. Um, the top left is uh, uh, the, the front of the building, which is uh, behind, uh, behind Chewy's, and then there's a brewery in between, and it's up against the uh, railroad tracks. And on the lower right is uh, that faces the Haynes Brothers. That's actually the, the, the Ridgely Road uh, that uh, it's on. <clears throat> As you can see, the location here uh, is just off of Old Fort. And again, most of you are familiar with where that is. And then here's a, um, an aerial shot or a GPS shot of it, of the building. Uh, as you, you can tell from our old building, we have very little parking. This is uh, lots of parking in the front. You can see the marked spots. And then in the back is, this is actually larger than it appears. Um, <laughs> it, there's a lot of room for our maintenance vehicles, for more buses. Uh, it'll really meet our needs uh, going forward. And this, this section here, where the mouse, there we go. This is, this is fenced and gated uh, already. So it's a, a somewhat secure location for those maintenance vehicles in the overnight hours and, and other um, times. So uh, if you see, that's, that's the spot I was alluding to right now mm -hmm. on the top left. And then you can see the, the back with loading docks, which we don't have. Uh, we don't have any loading docks at any school or where, where we can help transition those big trucks and things like that. This spot back here would help us with some programming uh, of uh, surplus items uh, in the future of we can only order a little bit. So then we would have the Costco Sam's model be able to get some bulk things, store it and use it in all of our sites um, and, and save some money. That's, that's the actual goal uh, intended there. And you can see the fence there in that one shot. Now here's the layout inside the building. There's nine current uh, tenants in the building. And if we're, you follow my mouse, that's the side we were looking at that's facing towards uh, Haynes Brothers. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then here's the front over here. All right, and then the back where the gravel parking lot and loading docks were. Uh, there's multiple tenants in here and part of the uh, after if we're approved with to, to proceed with the letter of intent then we negotiate other things that would come in uh, as part of how this all plays out when we uh, sign the contract but we're the a lot of this, the mid, mid, mid section is and I'll, I'll point out right here on the bottom these are, ba I didn't have a picture of this for you and I apologize for that. Uh, I've, it's, th there's uh, four bays over here that our buses can pull in. Oh. Okay, so there's one, where did my mouse go? That little guy's quick. That's why they call it a mouse. Mm -hmm. All right, so B, there's one right here on B, 
right here on C there's one, and D there's a bay here, and E there's a bay. Mm. Okay, and these are large, this is a large warehouse area right here, and it's hard to tell, but a, this, a bus would be right about, fit right about here. Mm. Okay. So there's a significant space, so significant space that'll really, really help us out. Is any questions about that? Square footage? 47,000 square feet, entire building. Uh, most of those units, you can look at them, they range from uh, 2,500 to 8,500 square feet. Wow. What kind of renovations would it require? Minimal. We, we, if we close today, we could move in this weekend and start work. Wow. Hmm. And I think part of that, again, we're, when we go back to the case lane pre K building, obviously we're moving into a warehouse, which is our maintenance facility. We're not programming it for students. Right. So there's a lot less we have to do. Uh, and, and that's one of the big perks on this is because there is going to be minimal actions we have to take outside of some security cameras, some more internet, things like that. Uh, it's pretty minimal. I know we're looking only tonight at letter of intent to start negotiating. Yes, sir. Right? Yes, sir. But I am concerned about those tenants that are in that facility right now. Mm -hmm. Now, if they haven't all signed a lease, then where are we legally? That that would all be determined in that next stage. Uh, right now, the, the current owner, that that's uh, what's up to to that to that to the owner and how he deals with those people that are in those units as of right now. But that's what we would be working out in the next phase, uh, in the next 30 to 60 days. If we are to get to proceed with the, with the letter of intent, then the next thing would be a, a contract. And would then you, that's when we would negotiate how that plays out. With the tenants that are there. Yes, sir. So, but Is that do, right, Ms. Go ahead. I can go ahead. I can answer. Uh, so we would have to look at changing some board policies that we have because right now we, we do not allow the leasing of any of our properties. Um, and we've got to be careful with that because once we open the door to leasing, we open the door to um, everyone to lease right. our premises. Right. So premises, premise I. Uh, <laughs> You guys get what I'm saying. <laughs> um, but I think that that is something that we're going to have to take into consideration as we move forward with negotiations um, and having a, the ability, this letter of intent, it gives us the ability to go to the owner to really have those conversations. There is a current lease. One of the tenants does have a current lease that goes through May of 2026. So there are some options that the board can consider if it wants to continue on with that lease. But the first thing we would have to do prior to approving the contract would be to approve a policy change. Mm -hmm. So I think we've got to be prepared for that. Well, that's a policy change for the board. That's right. To right allow now, leasing. Right now, the city can lease. Am I correct? The city is, um, the city does have a few different leases, and so they are um, legally able to lease um, pursuant to their own interests, but um, we would technically be the legal owners of this property and not the city. So again, our policies would apply uh, with regard to the lease. Okay. okay. And, and you mentioned it and through some of our initial conversations, I will say, you know, we want to, of course, do all we can to honor what was there. The tenants were, um, there are none of, there's only one tenant that actually has a lease in place. Um, the rest of them do not have a lease in place. And so, again, working with that current owner as far as how we execute that. All right, Mr. Barch, I, I'm sorry, do I have a question? Go ahead, um, So I'm super excited about this. I'm just really excited about this. I think it's going to be great uh, if we get it. And uh, but I have a question: If we do get it, what uh, what's going to become of the other place, the old place? That would be part of the agreement that where the city is, it, the, the city of Murfreesboro would. Is that city owned? It's currently we, we own it. We own that. We uh, Lauren had to do some digging, uh, <laughs> all the way back to 1990. The uh, board used to meet at Shoney's. I just want to put that out there. <laughs> I want to go back the to board that. Meeting. Okay. Right. So, so we don't know yet. 
Exactly. We, would we work, don't have their vote. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I saying, we work with the city. We've had initial conversations. They obviously are very interested in that piece of property. Mm -hmm. So we would address that as we would do an agreement uh, with the city of how we can make sure we're being obviously prudent with the taxpayer money uh, and the city using that in the best interest of the city. So we would work with the okay. city on that. Well, I didn't they know that, or have, were we going to sell it and then recoup some money, or that's kind of what I was. So the city asking. has a, the city does have a practice where whenever there's a transfer like that, they always w will try and make that right with the funds that purchase that. Um, but we do know, and, and we've known since the beginning when I first got on the board, started having a conversation, which kind of was that the city does have long-term plans infrastructure wise that would involve that piece of property so actually by us moving forward with this i think it may give the city a little leeway to to uh, continue to work on that infrastructure project well, okay the city could buy this property and we just swap it out that didn't uh, right. <laughs> even swap wouldn't you? even swap right <laughs> if you can work <laughs> that one well, that'll be great right? yeah that'd be great <laughs> that'll be great go ahead with that one life is made of dreams <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? I like the, the possibility. I really yes, sir. do. I think it's great. It's it's good location. It mm -hmm. if the if the buses only had to go out to the right on Broad Street, we're in good shape. But we've been out there multiple times, me and Mr. Rome, and checked it out, and so we're 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 good to go on Broad Street. Oh, I did have a question. I'm sorry. So all of our buses don't currently park at that location on New Salem, do they? No, no sir. And that would be the same thing when, for this facility? Correct. We will we'll be able to pull some of those back in. We won't have as many sure. out at uh, John Pittard Hob, uh, Hobgood overall Creek in Salem. Yeah. Okay. And I will say, because of the size of our city, and something Don and I have talked about quite a bit, it's really not a bad thing to have our buses spread out oh, for, wow. our, for our drivers to go straight to Salem versus having to go. Yeah to one central location then drive to the other end of the city so uh we will you know there's sometimes some maintenance issues but mr rum has done a fantastic job managing that system and we would anticipate that would continue on this new place uh, mr chairman I, I want to clarify something dr duke said i believe you said that we'd like to keep a healthy fund balance for situations like this mm -hmm. i think you meant opportunities like absolutely this. this is going to be incredible it, it's very exciting i hope everything plays out Go team. For the for the district, exactly. Let's let's do this one for West Ballard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this this is something that uh, when I first got on the board that we were talking about. So I'm super excited. Now I've been hearing about it since I've been here twenty years and yeah. I've been hearing about this for quite a while. So yes, sir. Whew. I've been here longer than that and I've heard about it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Appreciate Thank you. good report. I'm excited. Mr. Okay. Chairman, I, I move for approval. All right, we have a second. Second. Thank you, Mr. Richardson. Any question or comment? All in favor of the approval say aye. 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 In the opposition? And there is none. Thank you. All right, next item. I think reports and information. Yes, sir. Our first report tonight comes from Ms. Savisa. Board policy 4.406 requires that we annually communicate internet safety measures in an open meeting. So we are responsible for that, and I'm going to ask Ms. Abel to provide that tonight. Good evening. Good, Good evening. evening. I'm going to go through some very exciting policies that <laughs> <laughs> I'm yet required to let you know about. Um, Murfreesboro City Schools and its board supports reasonable access to various information formats for staff and students, emphasizing responsibility and, respons and appropriate use. Employees as well as parents or guardians must sign an agreement outlining the terms and conditions of internet use. Prohibited activities are, are outlined in that agreement. Security measures to control access and to ensure staff and student safety include content filtering services, limited user access, vendor compliance, and monitoring of online activities. Access to any harmful, obscene, or pornographic material is blocked through our internet service provider. Additional filters are placed on all district devices to block the receipt, viewing, or download of inappropriate content. <coughs> Vendors providing software or electronic services must ensure compliance with state laws, 
regarding the protection of personal student data. User access is limited to the data necessary for their role. Network server or other infrastructure access is given only to those roles governing those resources. Staff and students do not have access to each other's resources, and they do not have the ability to delete history or searches on their devices. City schools' email, email addresses are only supplied to staff and not to students. District resources, including emails, are prohibited for personal use. All data on school system devices, including emails, may be monitored and are subject to inspection. Um, in response to the increasing prevalence of artificial intelligence, the technology department and the instruction, uh, instructional technology work together to appropriately vet products before use by MCS staff. Currently, only teachers and administrators have access to a limited number of products. Although the internet, AI, and other technology provide a wealth of information, as such evolves, the technology department continues to look ahead at continued and expanded protection from the dangers that also accompany this. Do you have any questions? <laughs> so it's not as exciting as what <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Don Barch got to share, but. No question? Thank you, ma'am. Good report. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Budget preparation calendar. That time of year again. Already. Good evening, board. Good evening, sir. Nothing more exciting than what Mr. Visa had, but uh, <laughs> uh, we do have board policy 2.200. Uh, it requires us to create a budget calendar uh, no later than January 1st of the school year. Uh, this calendar is there to guide us, coordinate, and help us review and plan for the budget for this upcoming fiscal year of 25-26. Uh, this timeline does provide some uh, dates that uh, allow us for guidance, sort of an outline. Uh, ultimately, our main goal is to get it in front of you for approval and then to the city for their final approval. Uh, there is no action required tonight, just merely supplementary information. Any questions? Ms. Moore? Um, this is great. I love that we map this out and have sort of month by month. One thing I was looking for on here but didn't see is where we build in time to get feedback from parents, teachers, the community, sort of their ideas for what they would like to see in the budget um, where that falls in here. And I know last year, sort of at budget time, like our, our meeting time, we had asked for additional feedback from the parents, and so I wondered if that would be built in um, this year going forward. Yes, thank you for that. And we, we do have those already mapped out. So it'll start really the feedback piece in February, which with our teacher advisory council who does the big voice for teachers because there's someone from every school there. And in some community cases, two people. So that is always the third Thursday of the month. So that'll be around, uh, I think, February 20th is when the teacher advisory council will have their official meeting on the budget. Principals will do that during the February principals meeting. Um, and then we actually already have scheduled two Zoom meetings for parents based on the feedback we got last year to actually hold a meeting for parents and Ms. Trail and I set that for March. So on March 27th and she'll advertise we have a noon Zoom meeting and a five o'clock Zoom meeting where parents can join. Um, as the board knows, kind of the, the way those meetings run is I will present to the teachers to the parents, I'm sorry, to the teachers and principals first. Here's what I've been hearing from my roundtable conversations. Here's what we're hearing from just different um, sources of feedback. And we ask them to kind of prioritize what is most important. And then that's what I ultimately end up presenting to the board. Here's what our teachers said. Here's what our principals said. At that March meeting, um, we actually kind of do a preview of what we do with the board. I'll say to parents, here's what I've heard from teachers. Here's what I've heard from principals. Do you agree? Do you want us to focus on other things so we can bring you official parent information? Um, so that's what's already on the calendar. Um, we did, we currently don't have planned to do a full parent survey like we've done in the past, but if that's the desire of the board, we can definitely schedule that. Thank you. I, I appreciated when we did that last year. I, you know, I talked, I remember we had um, asked parents who were at a certain large event, but that didn't catch every possible family um, in the district. And so I think, I think we sent something out through Peach Jar or Dojo or something. So I like that, just giving everyone a chance. They don't have to fill it out, but if Absolutely. they want to, they at least it's come before them that they have the opportunity to 
have their voice heard. Absolutely, we can definitely do that. So we'll continue with the in-person, in-person, the Zoom face-to-face -face meetings. We'll continue with the Zoom meetings, but then I'll also work with Ms. Trail and Mr. Uh, Owens, and we'll get something out to every family in the district as well. Thank you, I appreciate that. All right, thank you, sir, appreciate it. <clears throat> All right, director's update, Dr. Duke. Yeah, just <clears throat> just a few updates. First of all, I know the board was at TSBA this week. I want to just give a special shout out. I know it may be coming up later to um, our team that presented. They did a great job. So I'm very proud of those that presented and represented us at TSBA. I am going to ask uh, Dr. Johnson to come up. Uh, at the last board meeting, um, the board approved for us to have a uh, begin the process of a collaborative conferencing with MEA. And so they have had that first, the board appointed the special question committee. So I uh, would ask um, Ms. Dr. Johnson to give us an update on where we are. Yeah, most definitely. So tomorrow morning at 7.30, um, the collaborative conferencing poll goes out to our certified teachers at 7.30 in the morning. That will run from November 13th until Friday, November the 22nd at 11.59 p.m. Um, so they, all of our certified staff have the opportunity to vote um, if they want um, to proceed with a collaborative process. All right. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Johnson? I just want to let you know we have we are moving forward with that, and hopefully we'll have before thanks well before Thanksgiving break. Yes. Kind of an update, Next right? Friday, the twenty second, we'll, we'll end the polling, and then we can report back from the board at that point. I will say, as sitting or listening with Maria on being on that committee, uh, there was some concern I think among members from the teaching profession about getting feedback from teachers. I, with Maria's okay and Luke Dixon's okay, I did send out an email this morning early to every principal encouraging them to encourage teachers to vote. I didn't tell them how to vote, just vote one way or the other. So we can get a, a pretty good feedback maybe because I, I think it's important that we hear from as many people as possible. Yes, so, <clears throat> excuse me. So the district, we actually have help with the messaging. So we actually did email, um, send an email to all of our certified employees to make them aware of the process and actually what the process means. And then again, we'll send out in the morning the email to them as well that gives them the link for um, the opportunity for them to vote if they chose to. Um, as well as principals are also made aware that um, representatives can speak at faculty meetings if they have those scheduled. Very good. Thank you. Uh, the only other update I had tonight is I just, and I did send an email, but I wanted to kind of publicly say uh, the state legislators has introduced a bill bringing vouchers officially back for this legislative session and that um, piece of legislation has been filed. So just for to recap, it is very similar to last year's bill in that it would fund 20,000 vouchers at $7,075 per student for families who wish to take those funds and send their children to private school. 10,000 of those 20,000 would be given out based on income and the other 10,000 would have no income requirement. Just a couple notes of a couple items to note in this legislation that set it apart from last year's. Um, it does say that scholarship participants must take a nationally standardized achievement test. I do want to point out that does not mean TCAP. Okay, the, the school that receives the voucher could select that achievement test that they would take. Uh, it also includes a one-time bonus of $2,000 to each public school employed teacher in kindergarten through 12th grade. Um, I also do want to point out here that the state's definition of teacher may be different than how we traditionally view teachers. So um, that state definition of teacher would include those actively involved in the classroom. It would not include our administrators, our academic coaches, or many other certified staff we have in the district. So therefore, if this were to pass and that was to become part of it, this board would have to have a conversation about the employees not covered under this legislation. One thought. Is that state-funded positions? It's, it meets the definition of teacher as it's outlined in the law, and I'd have to pull that exact definition. So yes, it would be state-funded positions um, that- Anything we have above the minimum program would be left up to the local completely, right? Yes, and positions that we fund, again, outside of that traditional funded program, uh, looking at it that way. 
Um, so we, again, we would have to have conversation with the board because I can assure the board the positions that we get the $2,000 from would not be every certified teaching position we have in this district and definitely none of our classified positions. Um, the new legislation does also create a funding source for the construction and maintenance of public school buildings. However, it's important to note that these funds are allocated based on first economically distressed counties, followed by schools and districts that have issues of natural disasters that may occur. There is a provision in the law, and again, this is something I'm interested to learn more about. The bill does include a provision that guarantees that state funding for a school district cannot decrease from the previous year, which is aimed at kind of quelling the concerns that students may leave and how that would impact the school district. That's the language of the law. Again, the, language, the law has just recently been introduced, so I've done some research, but is actually digging into what does that look like, but there is a provision in there for that. And then finally, there's a provision that explicitly states that homeschool students are not eligible. Uh, we know the homeschool community last year when this piece of legislation came out, uh, there was a large homeschool contingency that was very much against it. And so they have been, it looks like, removed from this piece of legislation. So a lot of similarities to last year. Obviously, some, some new pieces in there as well. It's something we're going to be watching very closely as it goes through the process and see if there's any uh, alternating pieces that come up. I will say this piece has been introduced in both the Senate and the House, those accompanying pieces um, that have been put in place. Um, again, I'm happy to answer your questions that I can, but I will say my knowledge is limited pretty much to what I just read. <laughs> What's the average cost of, of private education in the state of Tennessee? Yes, I do not have that information. It's about $13,000, isn't it? Yeah. It is. And yeah, so yeah. how much are they offering? Objection, the Your Honor. To educate a child. <laughs> private school. Private school education. Private school education. About $13,000 in the state of Tennessee. It's low, but and how much are... are 13000 a year, is that what you're saying? That's right. That's right. And how much are they offering? How much are they offering? Seven. $7,075. Well, gosh, if, if you can tell me how a, a family who's indigent, who's, who's impoverished, can come up with another six grand for education when we've got a free and public education, mm. I sure would like to know how to get that extra six grand. I'm sick of this legislation. I'm sick of the pony show. I'm sick of people who don't care about kids or public school. I'm sick of it. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. I have a question. Well, all right, sir, I agree. Yes, sir. Are they the same sponsors from the last time? Uh, I don't actually, I, I actually don't know the exact sponsor. I can't answer that. I can send you the actual legislation um, that has the sponsors, but I don't have that exact information. I don't think it's the same two that brought it up last year. I don't, I don't think so, but I could be wrong. I don't think so. <laughs> Other questions or comments? Anything else? I would like to say a big thank you to our staff our city school staff for handling of the situation Friday. Yes. They were well done. Thank you. Thank goodness. I have one more thing, if you don't mind. I don't um, mind, yeah, I'll go ahead. On the heels of the voucher, uh, I spent some time in pre-K this afternoon, which you know my heart, and I, I love early childhood education. Um, special ed pre-K is mandated by federal and state. Um, so I am proposing that we draft a resolution to the state asking for full funding through TISA. Uh, I put on your desk um, the financial of, um, of pre-K. So our revenues are around 313, which comes from grants, but our expenditures out of our local budget is 2.2 million mm -hmm. for pre-K. So right now we're servicing 143 students which I love that we can do that. Um, even if it wasn't mandated, I would suggest that we do it anyway. But um, if they are gonna mandate it, then they need to pay for it. So that's my motion. All right. And I, and I, think, I think what we can do, um, if, if, if that's the will of the board, is Ms. Uh, Bush can draft a resolution to bring specifically around this. I do think it's probably pretty timely as we talk about and the legislator is looking at taking money and, and, and moving money away from public education 
to private schools to understand that there is a very clear program that we are doing that is working for kids that we are still not getting funding for. Right. And so I think it would be a very timely uh, thing, and, and I know Ms. Bush can draft that as well. Yeah. Like, I'd like to add something. So we were at the uh, Tennessee School Boards Conference, the Tennessee School Boards Association Conference at the end of the week, um, where we have school board members from across the state. And as long as Mr. Settles and I were able to be part of our delegate assembly, where the association votes on our legislative agenda as the association um, for the year. And this was something that was passed there overwhelmingly, that school boards from across the state would like to see this be a focus for um, the legislature in 2025. So I think us it doing touches. this fits really yeah. in with school boards across the state. It touches every system, every district across the state. I mean, I don't see why not if we've got $7,000 to give out to people who are already sending their kids to private schools to help them continue doing that. I don't see why we couldn't do more. Agreed. Just makes sense yes. yeah. if, if we're just into school choice. <laughs> I have an answer. <laughs> there used to be a gentleman here who was a long-time representative in the House of Representatives of the State of Tennessee. And his most famous remark to me was, Butch, it's politics and politicians. And I think that's kind of what we're... I agree. I worry about things like school vouchers when, particularly in our district, we're a one-party district now. Everyone yeah. that was elected in the state legislature. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. so, anyway, that's my thoughts for you, I reckon. Anything else come for this board? Mr. Chairman, I just yes, sir. I, I, I need to remind everyone as we leave <laughs> that to go to the city's website, yes, uh, and there is a QR code on most of the material that's been circulating through our city. That will take you directly to the form. If you go to the city's website, you can punch a, a button. And I promise you, it won't take, if it takes two minutes, you're taking, you're, you're spending a lot more time than you need to on this. <laughs> you just need the number of people in your uh, home, the residents, and their names, and it re really, means a lot to us uh, being able to fund education to help fund our parks and our roads and it helps save your tax dollars so please fill that out uh, and so that we can count you in what is the deadline on that do you know uh, they'll be doing this into the next into next year so oh okay but we need to get done don't now. wait till the deadline no, don't, don't wait till the deadline <laughs> Go ahead and get i've it. already done it also shop local <laughs> well, that, I help, always see that. that helps too. <laughs> Anything else to come up for this illustrious board? I see nothing else coming up. All in favor of adjournment, say aye. 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 And I'll see you next time. <laughs>